advertising by the Canadian federal government for the sesquicentennial of Confederation began in 2013. Conservative government of the day planned to spend $20 million over a five-year period promoting Confederation as a key event in Canadian history. Advertising was, according to the government, aimed at increasing Canadians' knowledge and pride in Canada's history and heritage. 2015, Heritage Minister Shelley Glover explained that the, through these advertising campaigns, the Government of Canada will encourage Canadians to learn more about their history, commemorate events, celebrate accomplishments, and honour people that help shape what Canada is today. The Canada 150 logo, used in government advertising of the sesquicentennial, was the result of a, of a government-run contest for students. The contest was criticized as, a, as exploitative by some graphic designers, as 19-year-old University of Waterloo student Ariana Kuvin received nearly $5,000 for her winning design. Licensing agreements for commercial use of the logo were promoted by the Minister of Canadian Heritage and Official Languages. A number of businesses in Canada took advantage of the opportunity to promote their products by connecting them to Canadian nationalism and Canadian history though not always in logical or tasteful ways. KFC, for example, temporarily changed their logo to KFC. The Sobeys grocery chain sold hamburger patties shaped like maple leaves. And Tim Hortons promoted an abomination known as the poutine donut thankfully only available in the United States and thankfully only available on Canada Day. I love me some poutine and donuts, but did I draw the line here? The use of nationalist images and historical events in advertising in Canada has a long history, though not a particularly varied one. Journalism and communications scholar Ira Wagman notes that Canadian ads that have used Canadian historical images or events draw from a relatively small set of images and themes associated with unity, the use of technology to bind space, and ideas of national development. He questions the impact of the routine distribution of such advertising imagery has on Canadian historical consciousness, on the way Canadians recollect and understand their past. This impact is particularly problematic when the themes of unity, space, and national development draw on ahistorical, stereotypical, or racist images of Indigenous peoples in Canada. And the historic depiction of Indigenous peoples in morally problematic ways in Canadian advertising is a consequence of settler colonialism and ongoing Indigenous dispossession. Mainstream media, such as Canadian newspapers, have historically depicted Indigenous people as morally depraved, racially inferior, and or incapable of progress with progress defined in Western capitalist terms. In his book, The Imaginary Indian, independent scholar Daniel Francis explains the process whereby business uses a false understanding of indigeneity to sell its wares. This is a quote. Products are linked to the Indian in the expectation that some supposedly native virtues, such as environmentalism or stoicism, will rub off. Indians themselves become commodities in the marketplace. The advertising image is based on stereotypes of the imaginary Indian already abroad in the culture. In turn, advertising reinforces the stereotype by feeding it back into the mainstream culture in a self-repeating loop." End of quote. Such advertising thus is a result of and a contributor to negative societal attitudes toward indigenous people. Examples abound of the imaginary Indian and Canadian advertising. Britain, France, and the Canadian Dominion government relied on the doctrine of terra nullis to justify their occupation of indigenous territories in North America. This pamphlet from Canada's Ministry of the Interior in the late 19th century is just one example. Europeans are encouraged to settle in what is promoted as empty and therefore available land. And here's a more recent example from the Northern Development Minister's Forum. This shows that government reliance on stereotypes of indigeneity persists into the 21st century. Of 18 images included in their 2010 briefing paper on indigenous youth entrepreneurship, eight are images of nature or otherwise stereotypical images of Indianness, such as canoes, beating, teepees, or dream catchers. Only eight 
of the 18 images in this publication are of indigenous people actually engaged in business. Tourism-related businesses have long relied on depicting ancestral indigenous lands as empty space available for settler recreation, or on romantic stereotypes of indigenous peoples to market settler engagement with nature. Niagara Falls promoted Indian whimsy souvenirs as the necessary commodified evidence of a vacation. British Columbia promoted tourism to the province into the 20th century through what historian Michael Dawson describes as imperialist nostalgia. A common endeavor in which we absolve our complicity in imperialism, he says, by mourning the passing of a society that we helped to transform or subdue. Thus, for example, tourism ads describe totem poles as relics of an indigenous art form lost through neglect, despite the fact that they were neither lost nor neglected. Banff Indian Days were first organized by a committee of three Anglo male businessmen in 1902, and it ran until 1972. This tourist attraction saw park, sorry, saw park officials, residents, and visitors effect effectively colonize indigenous territory, lobbying for the prohibition of Aboriginal hunting and resource gathering while welcoming natives into a national park only for the Indian Day's duration. Advertisements for Indian Days described indigenous people as children of nature and depicted them in stereotypical stoic, static, exotic, romantic, and tragic ways that reinforced the fusion of environment and people. They described indigenous chiefs as staunch friends of the British Empire in Canada and as representatives of a conquered and disappearing race. A trip to Banff is not complete without seeing the dual spectacle of mountains and indigenous people. Tourists who departed Banff without seeing the two together had viewed a partial environment, historian Jonathan Claverton concludes. And just a couple more. This is a CPR ad for Banff Indian Days. It can be tempting to believe that such ads are limited to an earlier, less enlightened era. Surely the publication of the findings of the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism from 1967 to 1970 was the wake-up call that put an end to such blatant and egregious examples of racist and exploitative depictions of indigenous people in Canadian advertising. And yet, in 1988, Ward Air promoted their flights to Hamburg, Germany by depicting an indigenous man holding his ear to the ground exclaiming, Ugh! Must be 6.43 p.m. Ward Air flight ready to land. And then, of course, there's this. Yum Yum Chips, founded in Quebec in 1956 with their Little Indian logo, which they abandoned in 1990 after the Ganasataki resistance, or also known as the Oka crisis. But then in 2013, decided what would be a great idea? Reviving this logo for the holidays. Cardboard cutouts of the logo with a hole for the face were sent to convenience stores and you're encouraged to take photos of yourself and publish them in social media where you would dress up, therefore, as a stereotype of an indigenous person in an effort to sell chips. This was protested by groups such as Idle No More as well as the Mohawk Council of Ganawaki and the response of the company at the time was this is a tribute to the founder of potato chips, an indigenous chef. After two years of protest, however, including adverse reports in national newspapers, they finally abandoned this logo for a second time. The more sophisticated but equally troubling use of indigenous people in Canadian advertising has emerged in recent decades. Indigenous education scholar Tracy Friedel has analyzed such advertising by energy companies Shell, Nexon, and Syncrude Canada. These corporations use the popular image of the Indian as environmental steward. To promote themselves, she says, not only as environmentally friendly, but as friendly in a social sense, through the inclusion of Aboriginal peoples as economic quote-unquote partners in fossil fuel development. She notes that Indigenous people are not, in fact, included as true partners, but are part of the promotion of the image of corporate social responsibility. These energy corporations sell themselves as good and fair 
But she argues that the narratives of the corporation as good and generous merely hide the stark truth of contemporary development, that Canada's energy infrastructure is increasingly subject to the interests of transnational corporations rather than the communities whose image they so readily appropriate. <clears throat> Roots Canada has received acclaim for their recent Canada 150 advertisement that draws on the reputation of Canadians for being nice. I don't know if you've seen this one, hopefully. Is it possible to, if I click on this, will the internet come up and make it yeah. pay? Beautiful. Here's to 150 years of How do we switch over to this? So go on to Sorry. It's okay. Thank you, sir. Come from a cheaper university where we only have one one of them. Here's to 150 years of being nice. Not just the polite nice. Not the funny nice. The real nice. The kind of nice that takes guts. The courageous nice. The selfless nice. And the disruptive nice. But being nice means Fighting the good within the bad. Nice means screaming when you have no voice. Nice is opening doors when others are closed. Nice is standing tall when you can barely stand at all. And sometimes, nice is knowing that sorry just isn't enough. Canada, here's to another 150 years of being nice. Okay, sorry, thank you. So as you saw, the ad invokes the, stereo the stereotypical good of Canadian society, but also speaks of the disruptive nice. That nice means screaming when you have no voice, and that it's sometimes knowing when sorry isn't enough. That latter slog slogan being spoken over images of indigenous people. The ad campaign also exhorts people to purchase a trademarked nice button with proceeds to be donated to an indigenous youth empowerment program. With the, uh, the slogan, we encourage all of Canada to hashtag be nice to create an even better next 150 years. But how exactly might Canada and Canadian business in particular be nice? How might they create an even better next 150 years? Well, the TRC calls to action include one directed towards business and reconciliation. This is call to action number 92. While only one of the 94 TRC calls to action addresses business, this one may have the most profound impact on the process of reconciliation in Canada. David Newhouse, who is Chair of Indigenous Studies and Associate Professor in the Business School at Trent, observes that when it comes to reconciliation, universities are on board, provinces are on board, NGOs are on board, but there has been no discussion on business and yet it's one of the calls to action. Murray Sinclair, the TRC chair, commented, business leaders are still making decisions founded upon the twin myths that Aboriginal people are inferior and Europeans are superior. So if settler col colonialism is indeed a structure rather than merely a historic event, then call to action number 92 has profound implications in a society structured around capitalism. Past and ongoing indigenous dispossession must be addressed. An uncomfortable comparison may be drawn to the work of the German Business History Association, the Gesellschaft für Unternehmensgeschichte, or the GUG, as well as to recent efforts to uncover the role of African slavery in American capital accumulation. I'm going to briefly speak just of the former. German business historians in the 1980s revolutionized their field, compelling academia, business, and society 
to address corporate complicity in the Third Reich. In a similar way, Canadian businesses and business historians need to address the historical impact of business and commerce on Indigenous populations in North America. The problem, as Andrew Smith observes, is that few business historians, Canadian or otherwise, are actively engaging with the extensive literature on colonialism. And, I would argue, a key difference between Canadian business history and German business history is that the Third Reich came to an end, whereas settler coloni colonialism not only persists, but is largely unacknowledged in Canada. But, as Eric Ritzkies, the creator of the reconciliation, sorry, of the Colonialism 150 logo, reminds us, especially as Canadians gather to celebrate 150 years of the nation with a central theme of reconciliation, it is important to disrupt the national myth-making of Canada as a peaceful, multicultural nation for all. Business historians need to join with those studying Indigenous and colonial history to critically re-examine the ways in which business in Canada has participated and continues to participate in such myth-making. Thank you.